Thank you, Ray. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let's spend a spirit of prayer. Father, we invite your presence here again to fill us with your Holy Spirit, to give us words from on high. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to teach us which way to go and how to treat each other. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. And Lord, we want to be ready for your soon coming. We ask that uh, you be our teacher today, that you would teach us things that we could take into the highways and the byways that we can teach others about you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a very interesting... Uh, I've read this most of my Christian experience, and, and it's been... It's kind of long Christian experience. I've gone from... Uh, I, was, I was raised in a Baptist church when I was a a child and the Baptist preacher used to scare me to death he would say you're going to and I would I'll be like he's talking to me because I was bad my grandma my, my my grandfather made a point to and I was bad I needed a lot of spankings when I was a child he called me a heathen and I believed him and uh and I could see that through my life my life has been changed through different things and and uh I guess uh, my grandparents, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be here today. I mean, it, it, they were gracious. They, they were strict on me. They, I needed someone strict. I needed a firm hand, and I had a firm hand. And uh, I think that uh, I know that God has been touched, has touched me most of my life, and, and that's the reason I'm standing up here today, because I would be dead. I could tell, I'll go, I would go into some of the instances that, that I have that have put me in, into death's doorway, but I, we won't do that today. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, any, anyway, I, one instance that changed my life tremendously, uh, I was very arrogant at 13, and uh, I broke my neck at 13. And that changed me a lot. It didn't change me to where I needed to be, but it was starting to be a, a, a major change in my life, and it, and it brought me to it. And I, when, I, when I got up here today, I didn't plan to give a personal testimony. And, and, but anyway, I, God has, has used me uh, in, in diff, different ways in different people's lives. I, you know, I messed up some people's lives, believe it or not. Uh, you know, and, and, and to, to mature to the point that I have now, I, I would, t you know, uh, 25 years ago, if you had told me I was going to be a pastor of a Seventh-day Adventist church, I'd say, you're, you're nuts. You're crazy. I, I was into scripture, but I never felt uh, drawn to be in, into the ministry. I, I, I've always liked talking about scripture and, and, and dealing with it, and I've studied the Baptist doctrines. You know, I was a Presbyterian at one time. We rented this church, and I remember teaching Sunday school in that corner room out there. I was teaching the, the children. And uh, it, it, it was a real experience. I became a Catholic, studied to be a Catholic, and I... Uh, I was a Eucharistic minister, if you know what that is. That's, that's the guy that gives out the host. So I, I've had my, my uh, touchings with, with the different religions. But when I heard the truth from a, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor by the name of Kenneth Cox, uh, it was slow. And you know, if you know who Kenneth Cox is, he's very slow. He, he doesn't come out and attack you with, with doctrine. And, and I, I think that Kenneth Cox is a, is a man of God. He showed me who Jesus was. And, uh, I, and I think that was most important. Doctrines really help, but doctrines are, there, doctrines are important. The Bible is important. I mean, you can know this Bible from cover to cover and not know the author of the Bible. And that, that, that's just why I'm up here uh, today to talk about uh, we... As Seventh Day Adventists think that uh, you know we, we keep the Sabbath, you know we, we don't eat cheese. Well, some people don't eat cheese. Some, we're, we're vegetarian. We we uh, we know the state of the dead, and there's just different things that we know that other uh, other denominations don't. You know they could care less about. 
But that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is, is our, a loving relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because without that, it don't matter what you know. It don't matter who you know. And as Ray used to say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and I, I deal with that day in and day out. But I, I, you know, people that don't know the Bible, that, that, don't you just, that, that are nice people, don't you like hanging out with them? Don't you just like being with them? Yeah. But people that are, are exemplifying Christ, showing Christ and, and His love for humanity, you, you, you want to fall in, you fall in love with them. Because you don't fall in love with them, you're falling in love with, with who they represent, Jesus Christ. And, and if, if, you're, if you're not coming to church because you love Christ and you want to be with Him, you want to, and you, you, that's all you can think about is Him. If you're not here for, to, to worship Him in that capacity, then I, I think you're wasting your time. I, I really do. But I, I know that's a terrible thing to say, but if we don't, uh, if we're not uh, chasing after our true love, then what are we doing here? Uh, and and the, the, the story about Isaiah, it, it's it, the. Uh, I want to read a little bit out of Spirit of Prophecy. This is from uh, the Review and Herald, December twenty second, eight, December the twenty second, eighteen ninety six. And if you know me, you know how I feel about the Spirit of Prophecy. Uh, it's it's very important, and uh, I, that's as far as I'm going to go with it today. But I can I, I can. I can pre break out and preach sermon on the spirit of prophecy. I mean, just boom, like that. Because I love it. But uh, this right here, uh, the, the vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. Are we in the last days? Amen. Was Isaiah, when he goes into the throne room, I believe he, I believe he stepped into the throne room. And I, we're talking about a, a prophet of God. Isaiah before he went into the throne room. He was a prophet of God. And I believe he was thumping his suspenders if he had them. He goes into the throne room and he takes one look. And, and if you look at my, this, the uh, title of my sermon today, it's Loving and Holy. God we know is loving. Because the Bible teaches us that God is love. But let's not, let's not forget, God is holy. And, and we don't think of, we, we don't want to talk about God's holiness too much because it, it is it is um, well let's talk about Isaiah Isaiah saw what he was when he looked and he was stumping his suspenders and he saw God he goes woe is me and he falls down like a dead man I don't know what prompted this vision of Isaiah God is in control of everything, or as my buddy Ray says, He's in control of nothing. He's in control of everything, or He's in control of nothing. So, uh, this is a God-prompted moment for Isaiah. And, and Isaiah thinks he's all that. If you read the first five chapters of, uh, of uh, Isaiah, he's talking about how bad all of Israel is. But he forgets. And I think that the reason that this is for us today, it says the vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last day, is we're the same way. When you go before God and you see His holiness, it causes fear. I mean, it caused Isaiah so much fear that he passed out on the floor. I don't know if he was unconscious, but he, it, he, he saw the angel come and put the uh, coal on his lips. And it says that it cleansed him. It says, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged sin is gone he stands up he could not if he did not have if he had sin in him then he would have been he would have ceased to exist he had no he was sinless we're talking about a sinless human being now 
We may be active. We may do much work. But without love, such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ, we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. How can a true knowledge of self be attained? I mean, if we go to the scriptures and you go to Jeremiah 17, 9, it says about the human heart that it is desperately wicked. And that's hard for us to accept. I mean, the, the, we're talking about the nicest human being. We're talking about all human beings. Their hearts are desperately wicked. Now, Isaiah is one of these people with a human heart. And he goes into the throne room thinking he's all that. And he sees God. When I read... The vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. I think we're kind of cocky too. We are. We're kind of cocky. We, we don't want to think that if we go into the throne room, I mean, look at what it says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. Um, I hope that's the right verse. Every now and then I find them. It says, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We're blind. We can't see this. What is that saying I used to say, Ray? It's not it's not that I can't see. Yeah. The problem is not that I, it's not that I'm so blind. My problem is that I think I can see. I think that is a lot of our problems, is we think we can see. But like Isaiah goes into the throne room, he thinks he can see. Our hearts are desperately wicked. I want you to put all these things in your head. Don't let it go. Do not think, well, this is good for such and such over there, and this is good for such and such over here. It's talking to all of us. To each one, talking to me. I would like for myself to pay attention to what I'm saying. You have to ask, you have to speak to yourself about what I'm saying. Your relationship with God. Anyway, in one way. Only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. What is that saying that we say all the time? Beholding we shall become changed. So we're beholding Christ. It is ignorance of Him that makes men so uplifted that in their own own righteousness, self-righteousness. What did Gary say last week? that there were one in 20 people that would go to heaven if God came today. Let's change that number. Let's have that relationship with God that He's looking for. Are we looking to have a relationship with the, with, with the doctrines of God? Or are we looking to have a relationship with the God of the doctrines? Amen. Doctrines are important. Very important. That's one of the reasons I'm in the Seventh-day Adventist Church because of the doctrines of the Scriptures or the doctrines that I've learned through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is ignorance of Him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate His purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty. When we look at Jesus, that's, that, that's our yardstick. When we look at Him, it seeds us. It shows us. It's like looking, if we want to see how bad we are, we look in the mirror and it's, you know, <laughs> but when we want to see how bad our, 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 our uh, characters are, we look at Jesus Christ. Some of you, I know you might want to argue with me a little bit while I'm up here, but please wait till I'm done. And then you, you can uh, 
say what you want to. I, I don't know if I have a, have a have a, a talk with you, but please not while I'm up here today. I lost my train of thought. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. When we contemplate His purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness. Wasn't that what was going on with Isaiah? Like every other sinner, we shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's <coughs> infinite grace. Now, when I read that quote in Isaiah, or that Bible passage in Isaiah, Isaiah the, uh, I had a bulletin here, here it is. Verse 7, and it says, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is it taken away, and thy sin is purged. What that makes me think of is, our righteousness. How did God give the human race His righteousness? That is a question that, that, that has been argued for a long time. Even in the Adventist church, there's, there's different beliefs. And there's a book called The Humanity of Christ. And there's, I believe there's three views in there about the humanity of Christ. The, the one, that word itself, the humanity of Christ. Well, was Christ a human being like me? Yeah. Yes. He was also God. He was 100% man had He never been God. But He was also 100% God had He never been man. That's a hard... That, we, our finite minds cannot grip that. But it, it, He was born of a woman. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. If He had a, if he had a human mother, that means that He shared something with me. Galatians 4, 4 said that His mother was married. Well, she didn't say Mary, but it says he was born of a woman. So, if he was born of a woman, he had my DNA. Yeah. You know, the, the funny thing is, in, in Acts ch chapter 17, verse 26, it says that, let's go there. I'm not going to paraphrase that one. Acts 17, 26, it says, He is made from one blood, every nation of man to dwell on the face of the earth. That is an incredible statement. So, when Adam was created, I, I used to get down on my knees and show that, and I'm not going to do that today. But Adam, when Adam was created, the DNA for every human being was in Adam. That's a strange thing to think about. I've, I've, I've dealt with this also with, with, with several different people. And it's, it's a fun thing to think about and talk about. But you get into things like uh, incest. Bad word. I shouldn't have used that word. You get into things like that, though, because you got uh, brothers and sisters and getting together for, for the beginning of creation. But if you look at the Bible... If you look at the Bible, Abraham was married to his half-sister. So there was something different about before the flood. And I don't understand it. Maybe somebody else can teach me. After, we, after the service today, you can talk to me about it. But as far as I can see, the Bible teaches that we come from Adam, every one of us. We, have, we, we all are, this is not the, the uh, uh, African race, the, 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 the different races. This is 
the Mexican, you know, you name it. This is the human race. We all came from the same dad, Adam. If you could prove it different, please uh, show me. From Scripture. And we'll talk about it. But uh, when Adam sinned, and this is Romans 5, 18, when Adam sinned, we were in him. So it passed on to us. So it, it's not fair that we're... It, it, and it's not. It's not fair. But that's just the way it is. We're kind of, you know... We're in. We're in. The, we're here. We're at this point, and at such a time as this, that. Uh, but how's God? How did how did God fix the problem? Because one man can't die for another friend man sins. That's what Ezekiel chapter eighteen verse twenty six. I think that's the right verse. One man can't die for another man sins. So. How can Jesus die for my sins if one man can't die for another man's sin? He becomes me. He becomes my substitute. So if he becomes me, then he can die for me. I don't understand it. All I, can, I, I, I mean, I, I've got this to, to, to tell me. Anyway, um, when you look at Romans 5.18 and... That, that is a, it's a beautiful study of the book of Romans. It said, uh, Martin Luther called it the uh, most complete gospel in the Bible was to the Romans. And it was because Paul, all the other nations or all the other places that Paul visited, he wrote letters to. He, he visited. He was there. But he never went to the Romans. He never went there. I, I, anyway, he, had to give, he wanted to give them a complete gospel. This is according to Martin Luther, so that's not Bible. That's Martin Luther. He, and, and if you read the book of Romans, it is a complete gospel. But if you go to uh, Romans chapter 5, and verse 18, and I think this, I used to say this is the most, my most favorite chapter and my most famous verse is Romans, 5, it's Romans chapter 5, and it's verse 18. And it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense... Judgment came to all men. That one man was Adam. Came through Adam. Resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. If you look up that word justification, it only happens two times in Scripture. It actually happens three, but it, the same meaning is, is twice, and it's in verse uh, 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 chapter 4 of Romans in verse 25. But this word is, if you look it up in the Greek, it's dikaiosis. I don't know if that's the right spelling. I'm not a Greek speaker. But dikaiosis means that God has declared the human race justified. God has declared, He looks at the, at the human race as though we've never sinned. That's how he looks at us. But does that mean everybody's going to be in heaven? Because if you read, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe would inherit, inherit eternal life. That There's two, part, two parts to justification. One is God's part. He did his part. Now it's our part. Our part is to believe what God said. And if you read uh, Romans 3, 16, 17, and 18, it kind of it, it's, it's expands what I just said. Anyway, I, I'm running out of time. I, I, I said this was going to be a short sermon to myself this morning and to someone else. <laughs> it's turning into... Uh... Anyway, uh, I'm not apologizing. People get upset with me when I apologize. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that either. Okay, now, uh, Jesus himself, if he had my flesh, he had sinful flesh. 
sin, and this is how you get it. This is this this is how you answer that. Sin requires participation. You have to participate. Sin requires participation. Did Jesus ever participate in a sin? Thought, word, and deed. No. So he qualified to be, as we, as I said earlier, to be the substitute for each one of us, because he took each one of our places. You know that that will boggle your mind just thinking about that. He, how, how can God figure this out? I, what was strange to me is God figured it out. How could He get us to figure it out? <laughs> That's the hard part. You know, uh, I. Uh, Sin is deep within us. Because we have the truth, and we go to church, and we're Seventh-day Adventists, we keep the Sabbath, and we eat tofu, I've already said this, and is that going to save us? No. Often we worship doctrines instead of worshiping our God. The doctrines are good. I mean, we've got good doctrines. We've got a, a, a perfect study right here, the Bible. We, if we learn it from front to back, if we don't know, and, and, and I've already said this, if we don't know the, the author of the Bible, then we're lost. Is it, we, we have wasted our time memorizing this unless we know the Savior. Like I said, we want to we wanna fall in love with Him. When you read the scriptures and you start to see what Jesus has done for the human race, you, you want to be with Him. You, you, you fall in love with Him. You, you, it's, it, if you, like I said, if you, if you haven't desired to be with Him to that point, then you're wasting your time in church. I, I, I love you being here. I like the people here. I love the people here. Or I wouldn't be here. But it's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. All the great people in the Bible come to the, come to the point and have talked face to face with God. You could go for, through every person in Scripture and see how they have met God face to face. And Isaiah especially. Fear God and, and give up self entirely. Is that what Isaiah did? Do we say we love Jesus, but we love self more? Do we say we live for Jesus, but we live for self? How much time, ask yourself, how much time do you spend with Jesus? How much time, how, what, what, the time you spend with Jesus, it shows how much you love Him. Are we just in love with our doctrines? You know, I love the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but we cannot put them above our, our Savior. I know the story of a woman. She was an SDA, and I'm going I'm to speed this up. I, I don't talk fast too, too good, so <laughs> I may not be able to. I don't want to leave any details out, but this woman was five. She was, an S, uh, she was uh, baptized. See, I'm trying to go too fast already. I'm just going to slow down to my speed. This lady was baptized at nine years old. She came to church faithfully. She was keeping the Sabbath. She was paying her tithes. She was eating vegetables. She was singing in the choir. And she told the pastor that prayer doesn't do anything for her. She says, it doesn't feel like God answers my prayers. She said, when I struggle, I ask God to help, and nothing happens. She says, after several months, what I prayed for, it just kind of it just kind of happens, but God ain't got nothing to do with it. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that, this, is what she, this, is, this is a true story. Her friend told her that, her, that, that that's wrong what you do. She says, what do you mean that's wrong? He says, well, 
All you do is pray just to solve your problems instead of praying to know God. And that's the, the what, I, what I want to talk about in this story. Do we pray to solve problems? Or do we, I mean, God says bring all your prayers to me, of course. But is that all we do? Uh, or, do we pray, or do we pray to God to know Him? Prayer is not a matter of solving a problem. It's a matter of having our, a relationship with God.